Yeah, live. All right. Uh, I hope you guys got something to drink and all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of stuff over there. Um, we will be on uh, taking a little bit of a break from what uh, Patch has been talking about uh, because his computer decided to uh, crash. <laughs> so while he's getting that situated, I'm going to do it tonight and possibly next week as well. Um, tonight I want to talk about uh, not giving up on people, and I, I kind of just that when, when, when you say don't give up on people, people kind of get their own ideas about this, so I'll try it and, and, and walk us through it. Uh, we'll start off in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Um, chapter 3. Starting in verse 14. You know, there's a lot of good things in uh, in the Bible that people just don't realize are there. <laughs> you know, if you've only read the Bible like once or twice, it's like, oh, I didn't even know that was in there. Um, okay, so in verse 14 it says, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him, so he will be put to shame. Yet, in verse 15, yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So we have a few what seems like contradiction, contradictory uh, uh, statements here from Paul. And it's just, okay, so you want me to not associate with them while not treating them as enemy? How is this going to work? So uh, let, let's look at that. The first thing is, the, the, that I want to kind of focus in on is I am specifically talking about when a Christian is living in sin. Okay, so let me kind of just say this before we get going on this. When there is a non-Christian living in sin, there we go. when there is a non-Christian living in sin, I mean, you, you can't really hold non-Christians to a Christian standard. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, that's just the way of, the way of things. Um, so, okay. The first thing that we see from Second Thessalonians is do not agree with or condone the behavior. Sometimes we're close with somebody, and so we kind of start taking sides in the conflict. You know, oh yeah, they, they, they did wrong to you and all this stuff. And we actually ended up making the problem worse uh, because, well, A, we weren't a part of the situation, so we really don't know what's going on. <laughs> and uh, B, we're helping them to not reach a place of seeking forgiveness from God and people. Remember, the whole purpose of, of Christianity is all about restoration. We're being restored to God. We're being restored to people. Um, that's kind of the whole idea of it there. So if you look at verse 14, it says, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him. And then it says in 15, Do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, admonish means, well, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, so the second thing that it says here in, in, in verse 15 is it says to tell them what they're doing is wrong. He says, uh, admonish him as a brother. Warn him. Warn him. See, a lot of times when we see someone in sin, well, I don't want to do anything to offend them. Or Hebrews clarifies this. It is impossible, impossible, for you to renew a person to walking with God if they have left the faith. Because they know what they've left. You can't preach Christ to them again because they've already heard it and they've walked away from it. See, and we're not talking about we're not talking about a Christian who stumbles. We're talking about a, uh, an ex-Christian, somebody who leaves the faith. Okay. Um, do not associate with them. Uh, I'll get to what that word associate means in just a second. But it says here, if anyone does not obey our instruction, take note of them. Do not associate with them, so that he would be put to shame. I kind of see Christians going to two extremes a lot of the time. Uh, one, they try and carry on the relationship like nothing happened. That's it under the rug and keep going. The other extreme that I see happening is Christians try to just treat them with absolute hate. And, and, and you, I mean, you see this, um, the JWs actually teach this. It's, it's called um, excommunication. And I think uh, at least some Catholic uh, churches do this as well. The idea is that you, you, you shun them and there's no contact whatsoever. But this, that's actually not what the Bible teaches. There, there, is, a, there is a middle ground here. Um, so associate, the word associate, do not associate with this person. It means to be linked, connected to. The Greek word itself actually means to mix with. 
So think of, this is a great, uh, a great little visual idea here. Um, for those of you who have ever baked, uh, imagine you have your ingredients in the bowl and you're mixing them together. It, exactly that side of the word. Do not mix with them. Okay? So, that, so it's not necessarily absolute refrain from them so much as it is uh, not being friends, being close, intimate with them. Does that kind of make sense? Um, and then the next thing here, so do not keep up with them or try to still be friends. There's going to be a gap there. And if you try and, and still be friends with them, what's going to happen is they're going to lead you into their sin. I've seen it happen countless times, and I have never once, never once seen a Christian be able to get an ex-Christian to return to the faith by being their friend. But I've almost, all, almost always seen that Christian end up leaving the faith too. So, I mean, I think that's something that needs to be said. Uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the world's most vocal atheists uh, were actually grew up Christian. Uh, Richard Dawkins, I'm sure most of you guys have heard of him, he grew up in church and uh, uh, just had some bad experiences. And now he's on this crusade to talk about Christians, attack against Christians. And that's just one example. I mean, I have many more examples, but you get what I'm saying. Um, so then another word here that I had no idea what this word meant. Uh, it says in verse 15, admonish him as a brother. Basically, what that word, what that word means is to warn sternly. So the idea here is that they are going into danger and you are warning them. Um, they will either turn from their sin or separate themselves from you or oppose you. One of those three things is going to happen. First off, is probably the most common. That's where they oppose you. Sorry, in backwards order, I guess. Um, so you say something to them, they get their feelings hurt, then they're going to start talking to other people behind your back. And you're going to suffer for doing the right thing. It's important that you keep a good attitude because this is the heart of Christianity. In fact, Jesus talked about this a lot. <laughs> Suffering for doing what's right. Just keep on doing what's right. What we do is we do what's right and then somebody takes it out on us, and so then we try and, like, match their stupid with their own stupid. Uh, and so we try to, like, trump it, you know? Okay, so, so, so you, you did something stupid, so how, what can I do stupider to get back at you? And it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It's not going to work very well at all. Um, you'll, you'll end up becoming very uh, bitter, and it'll, it'll hurt them even worse. I mean, there's just no winning from that. Um, then the, the second thing there... They will separate themselves from you. So, so they'll just kind of start maybe lying or, or not really just being front with you and kind of just not really, you know. They know, they know that, that, that you know what they're doing is wrong and that you're not condoning their behavior and you're warning them, look, you're, you're living in sin. People usually don't like to be told that. I, uh, I, uh, uh, I can count on uh, one shot, uh, shot teacher's hand how many people like that. <laughs> um, and then the, the, the last thing, it happens fairly often too, they, 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 not often, it happens very infrequently, they turn, turning from their sin. Um, but, now this is the real kicker. Verse 15 clarifies, yet do not regard him as an enemy. Do you know how difficult that is? <laughs> I can do extreme. I can treat somebody as an enemy, and I can treat them as a brother. But I can't do both. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't, I can't, um, um, Keep a good attitude and, and keep bumping into them and them still continuing to oppose me and being just a massive jerk. And I have a really hard time with that. And maybe I'm the only person in the world. <laughs> um, don't be their friend, but don't give up on people. Now, what do I mean by give up on people? Are you praying for them? Are you expecting for God to do something? That is not giving up on them. This is not giving up on them. Hey, you want to go hang out? Eh, big mistake. You're gonna, it's going to start rubbing off on you. It does every time. Um, so that brings us to the question of how. How are we going to not give up on people? Well, thankfully, Jesus gave us some great examples in Matthew. Now, I, I could talk a lot about what he said, but I, we're specifically going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It says this, uh, starting in verse 43 and going towards the end of chapter 5, which is verse 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now see, that, that makes sense. That's, um, that's something that we all naturally feel. Okay, So I can roll with that. But this is where it starts heading south for us, guys. Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
verse 45, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. That's an incredibly important phrase there. We'll come back to that in just a second. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, there's just a lot that he is saying. And it, it, it is exactly what we're looking at. Exactly what we're looking at. So let's take this verse by verse. Ver, uh, starting in verse uh, 44. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So basically, do not act hateful. Okay, so we are keeping a distance from somebody, but we're not acting hateful. Okay, well, this is going to be a little bit, a little bit hard. <laughs> um, if you've ever had somebody who betrayed you and, and who, you know, it does that, that deep hurt and resentment, how do you not act hateful? <laughs> this is not good. Can you give me some kind of an outline here, God? So then we get to, um, so then we get a few ideas here, but um, it, spe it specifically says, pray for them. In verse 44, pray for those who persecute you. Okay, well, there's one thing, but he also says in 44, another step, love your enemies. Hmm. So that brings us to the question, now what do you mean love? Jesus answers this um, after, uh, in another part, uh, it's known as the story of the Good Samaritan. And he says, who, who, was the, who, you know, who did the right thing? And Well, the story is this, the, the, the Samaritan did the right thing. And so what did the Samaritan do that was the right thing? Well, he saw someone in need. Even though they were born enemies. So I think that that kind of clarifies the question of what it means to love your enemy. Can you say that you loved your enemy if you see them suffering and you laugh? <laughs> I wouldn't say that that's loving them. Uh, can you say that you love your enemy if you see them broken down on the side of the road and you don't stop? See, it's easy to drive by people with problems because they're not your problems. But when you're the one broken down, it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> so this, this kind of gets into an area of, of very, very hard. Because you have to love them even though you're keeping your distance from them. That is a hard thing to do. And it's, this, it's, this, it's like walking on a tightrope. You're not always going to know what the right thing is to do. But you just keep moving forward and seeking after God and hoping that you're doing the right thing. <laughs> and... Uh, you just keep seeking after God, and he kind of works things out, and you just keep a good attitude. So verse 45 says, um, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Ooh. For he causes his son to, uh, to, um, to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, in our day, the rain is kind of symbolic of, of, of sadness and sorrow. But at this time... Rain is more of an imagery of blessing. The rain caused caused um, increase. Uh, farmers would wait eager. Most of most of the people who Jesus was talking to, they were farmers and they were poor. That was the grand majority of the population of Israel in those days. Um, so for these farmers, for them to hear rain, they wouldn't think with the mod how we think of it, like oh, the bad times. God sends the sun. That's the happy times and the rain. The bad times to everybody. That's not what he said. The sun and the rain, you need both for your crops to grow. And that's who he's talking to. He's saying two different kinds of blessings that God brings on everyone. That puts things in a little bit different perspective. Because, see, if he was saying two a good thing and a bad thing, that would mean we could do a little bit of a good and a little bit of bad. <coughs> but that's not what he said. He said two different kinds of blessings. Ooh. Ooh. Now we're getting into some painful territory because it's not comfortable. It is not comfortable to do this. So, God uh, brings blessings to everyone. He doesn't change who he is on account of someone. You act in that same way. See what I did? I'll, I'll take that bit by bit. God brings blessings to everyone. That's the idea of it. So what does that mean? It means that God doesn't change who he is because of what someone else did. So if you want to be, as it says here, sons of your Father who is in heaven, you have to do the same. Oh. That is a painful thing to do. When you see somebody mistreating your grandkids, ooh. When you see somebody at work who's lying about you and it's making the boss treat you differently, oh, that is hard. 
When you see your kids doing something that's just unbelievably stupid, oh, that's hard. I mean, guys, this is hard. I mean, I, I wish it was easier being a Christian. <laughs> Man, it's just, that's hard. So, okay. Now, I, I, I'm, once again, I, I need to clarify again. I'm not saying keep doing the same stupid thing over and over again. You know what I mean? Like, continually giving money and providing for a drug addict. That's just, that's just stupid. I mean, that's not showing them love. That's helping them to stay in their problem and not get the help that they need. And then if they overdose, it's partly your fault because you helped them to be able to buy those drugs. So I, I am I, – I, I'm, I'm not saying throw away all wisdom on this, okay? So just putting that out there. Moving on. Uh, verse 46. For, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? So the tax collectors, obviously, people say this all the time. They, people really didn't like the tax collectors. Nothing has changed there uh, because uh, they kind of were robbing the people blind. Nothing has changed there. <laughs> but the difference is um, we are robbed by taxes legally, <laughs> and they were robbed by taxes illegally under the table. So uh, same, same kind of idea, and surely you can kind of uh, uh, see what he's saying here. Uh, so do not even these people who you hate and despise, aren't they doing the exact same thing? Ooh, you're acting just like, just like sinners. Oh, no, Jesus, no. Come on, I thought we were homies. <laughs> so here's the thing about this, guys. If you love those who love you, that requires no effort. And here's, here's the payoff. It also yields no results. There's no... Payback. Because you're just giving the people what they deserve. Anybody can do that. Do you know why it's so easy to love dogs? They never do anything wrong. They run up and they lick you and they just they just love you. And I mean, yeah, they crap in your yard and, and you know, yeah, they, they sometimes eat your kids' shoes. That does happen. But they're not they're not willfully just trying to irritate you. They're not going following behind you and like, how can I ruin this person's day? It's easy to love animals. It's hard to love people because people aren't perfect. And people don't run up to you and lick your hands and get all excited. <laughs> I mean, oh boy, oh boy, if your enemies did, if your enemies did that, man, it wouldn't be, it would be kind of hard to stay mad at them, you know? Hey, buddy. Hey, let's go for a walk. You ready? Yeah. I mean, that would be easy. Really easy. So, but here's the thing. Um, I'm not just talking about physical rewards, I'm also talking about spiritual rewards. It yields no rewards in two arenas. First off, when I love someone who loves me, but I don't love somebody who, who, who doesn't love me, there's no earthly reward in that because people are, I mean, everybody does that. But also, there's no spiritual reward because God rewards people who are treated unjustly. Amen. The, the Bible says that he watches out for the mistreated people, and he expects us to, too. Mm -hmm. The orphans and the widows, and the, God is always talking about that kind of stuff in the prophets. That's his heart. People who are mistreated and, and, and cast aside and seen as, as outcasts that nobody could ever love. In, in our modern day, that would be the drug addicts. <laughs> nobody wants to, wants to talk to the drug You know, I, I, I was talking to Gracie about this the other day. Everybody talks about how they want to help kids and the foster care and all that different stuff. But nobody talks about helping the drug addict parents. If you help the parents, the kids wouldn't be in the foster care. That's right. mm -hmm. you, you, they're, they're connected. The kids didn't just drop out of outer space as much as sometimes we think that they did. <laughs> so anyways, uh, and then in 47 it says, If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Don't go out looking for stuff. But just don't let another person's meanness make you mean. See what I mean? You have to keep doing the right thing because that's who you are. See what I mean? Not because someone deserved it or because they didn't deserve it. You have to do what's right because it's right. That's what he's saying here. Don't, don't be blown by the wind like everybody else in the culture is. Oh, well, you see this kind of stupid stuff on Facebook all the time. You know, I, I, I'm loyal until, you know, you do something mean to me and then I just hate you for forever. So, well, you know, that's not really loyalty, A. And B, having that kind of attitude is just, it, you're always on edge. If anybody does the smallest infraction against you, it's like, oh man, it's the end of the world. But you can't live on edge like that. You, you can't live your life preserved. Um, 
And so really what I want to get at of this in verse 47 is that we are expected to do what non-believers don't. But that's not fair. No, it's not. And Jesus showed us the perfect example. It's not like he's telling us just something he didn't do. Dad talks about this all the time. When you, when you tell kids, uh, do what I uh, say and not what I do. Jesus didn't do that. He told us, but then he also did it too. So, I mean, he, he made sure we had the full thing to, to, to look at. Um, if you ever betray me. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so now going on to verse 48. Uh, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the word here, perfect, doesn't mean sinless. Um, the thing about ancient Greek, in, as compared to modern English, modern English is a very exact language. And it's not very conceptual, you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to think about the words you're saying, they're just kind of real literal. In other language, a lot of other languages, except for English, <laughs> the words, uh, they carry thoughts with them. You see what I mean? And, and it's like, um, it has a whole concept attached to it. Like, we're, Diana and I were talking in the car. We, there was a song that she couldn't give me an exact translation because it was more uh, a concept. So you, you wouldn't be able to really translate into a word. But she said, basically, it's kind of like this. And that's kind of how Greek works a lot of times. Yeah, a lot of languages work. They have kind of a concept with them. And so words in, in translations sometimes give us a little bit of a problem because we're just not real sure how to translate the word. Does that kind of make sense? So they do their best in the translations, but there's room for error. That's why there's so many translations in the world because it's not an exact. And if you want exact, go learn Greek. <laughs> you know, it just, it just doesn't work like that. Um, so the idea here is more of um, the, the word perfect means kind of like reaching its completion. Uh, um, think of, okay, so if you um, ran a race to the end, you were perfect. You completed. Um, if you met your goal on something, you were perfect. Um, it also carries kind of the connotation of maturity, is how I put it in, in here on the screen. Uh, the idea of um, reaching a higher level than currently at. And I guess it, it, it's kind of it's kind of hard, to, but just mature is, is good enough, I guess, for you to get that idea. Um, mature, so like continue to mature, okay? As your Father in heaven is mature, that kind of get the idea. So in other words, you are working towards being like God. That's a, that's a that's a pretty good pretty good idea there. And so the idea is act like God. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You are to be mature as your heavenly Father is mature. Why am I putting forth so much effort towards these pain in the butt people who I just want to get rid of in my life? Why am I trying so hard to, to, to love everybody and to pray for people? Because you are maturing as your Heavenly Father is mature. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. We are reaching towards a definite goal. We live our life with a purpose. So uh, maturity in us comes through a lifestyle of making the hard but right choices. Hard, but right choices. Life is all about hard choice or soft choice. It's easy to make the soft choice. It's easy to sit on the couch all day eating potato chips. It's hard to get up and exercise, to get up and go do something with your life. That's hard. It, it, like, like, uh, like uh, who was it? Um, I think it was Gandalf who said it. I don't remember one of those, when Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, he says, it's dangerous business walking out your front door. It is. It's easier to sit down and do nothing. It's, that's super duper easy. You'll never get hurt in ministry, you'll never, but you'll never have success. You'll never have anything to show for it. You'll never have victory. You have spent your entire life on yourself, and it will never make you happy. It will never make you happy. God will literally follow after you and take away the things that you started and used to enjoy. And it will become less and less pleasurable until you stop being so stubborn and do what God told you to do. Don't believe me? Go try it. Have fun. I'll meet you back here in about 15 years because that's how long it'll take for you to get your head screwed back on. And then you have to start working your way back up the hill. So have fun with that waste of your life. But then he's telling you, um, take my word for it. It's a huge waste of your life. Maturity in us comes through a lifestyle of making the hard but right choices. You know how hard it is to spank your kid? Oh, it's hard. No, it's hard. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> they look up at you with your little eyes. <laughs> My, 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 little, my little girl, Teresa, she's got the biggest eyes. Oh, guys. Oh, man. 
And she and she dresses all like a princess and everything. And she's like, she does that whenever she gives me her hand to make it. I'm like, well, that's hard. Oh, but it helps her yes. to be a better person. Yes. And so I have to sacrifice what is comfortable to do what is right. Ministry is the exact same way. It's easy to be a Christian who goes on Sunday. That's really easy. And you give up a few hours of your time and that's it. It's hard. To obey the voice of Jesus and go and reach other people. Oh, that's hard. Especially when they're a pain in the butt. Especially when he sends you to people you don't like. Oh, that's hard. That is so hard. But that's where maturity comes in. So I want to give this final challenge, especially to anyone who's over the age of 40. This is, this is really important. If you didn't listen to anything else I said, I don't care. Remember this. <laughs> Grandparents, you are strategically placed to pray for your grandkids and kids. God has placed you where you are. You're not dead yet. Stop acting dead. We get this retirement mentality in this. I don't have to work anymore, so therefore I shouldn't work at anything. Run from retirement. Never retire. You can quit your job. I don't care. Do not retire. Because if you're breathing, God has something for you. And I want to specifically throw this out to grandparents because in our culture, it's very, very common to have grandparents raising the grandkids. And it's very, very, very common in our culture to have misplaced families. It's only one parent, maybe, that kind of situation. Um, so grandparents, you, are, you have been strategically placed. Strategically placed. It's not a burden to be this. We were at this church, uh, this church leadership thing, and he talks about this all the time. Don't talk about, I have to do ministry. You say, I get to do ministry. Yes. It changes the way you look at it. And it's the exact same thing with, with having, having grandkids. It's not a burden to be the secondary line of defense. Amen. See, God made this thing called the family. And sometimes Amen. our will gets in the way of God's will. You, grandparents, you're the secondary line. Okay, the, the primary, those are the parents. Once you've parented, your kids are out of the house, you have to transition to this awkward phase where you're still a parent, but now you're not really the parent, and it's just awkward. And with that awkwardness, though, your purpose isn't gone. God has just given you a new purpose. But do you know what happens in sports when you move your catcher to, I don't know, third baseman? And he has never done it before, and he has no idea how to do it. It takes him a while to get the hang of it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You have to learn your new position. You have to learn your new position. It's a privilege and what you have been positioned for. You exist for just such a time as this. We all, we all think, well, I want to retire and grow old in comfort and never have any problems. Why? That's for the birds, man. I mean, you're not dead yet. Stop acting dead. Your role changes with age. You are no longer the parent, but that doesn't mean you are no longer have any role at all. Learn your new role and excel at it, like in sports. See, the thing is, one day you will have rest. It's called heaven. Any rest you're going to find in this, on this earth is never going to be the rest that you're looking for in heaven. So stop acting like the next vacation, the next you know retirement, the next that's going to be your moment of rest. I hope to God it's not. Because you have too much potential in you to let it go to waste. Too much potential. Now, in this moment, keep praying for them and refuse to give up. Refuse to give up on them. Keep praying on them no matter what they do. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. Don't enable them. Don't help fund their lifestyle. If, if your kid is 30 years old, they do not be, need to be living with you. They need to go get a hot place of their own. I'm not saying so to support their bad lifestyle. I'm not saying it at all. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. Don't ever give up on them. And that's really the, the idea of it. I specifically have this message in mind for grandparents. I know there are not, not everybody here is grandparents. So just do with it what thou wilt. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're going to go ahead and stop there. Um, but before we, before we stop the recording, though, um, I would like, um, if it's... Not too. I know, I know he's probably getting you know comfortable over there. But uh, could Pastor uh, close us in prayer and specifically pray for the grandparents for God to uh, guide and direct them? God, we thank you for this word and, and pray that you would continue to teach us these things, Lord. We so different than the way the world thinks, and, and God, as much as your word is, and God, that you would teach us to 
how to deal with uh, people that go into sin and are off into sin, and to, to have that attitude and to not be an enabler. And God, for us as grandparents, that you would continue to uh, show us that uh, we're not in an age of retirement, we're in an age of change, in an age of transition. And God, you still have a plan for us and a purpose for us. And God, that we would be that uh, loving, supportive parent and grandparent. God, continue to use uh, each one of us, Lord, for your 